lead, and uh, we'll hand it back over to Pierre Paquette uh, to deliver tonight's guest of honor lecture. Pierre. Thank you, sir. Um, do you guys see this? Uh, no. Okay. So, um, can you hear me well? Yes. So we're going to talk, of course, about the SRA, but uh, first I'm going to introduce myself a little bit. Um, Mark did a very good job. Um, so we're going to see what the SRA is and what it's not. Um, I wrote Ptolemy's planetary theory, but I removed it from there. Um, forgot to remove it from the... Uh, the menu. Uh, we're going to talk about the astrolabe parts because, well, it's like a car. I mean, you can't go driving one if you don't know what does what, or at least the basics, uh, how to use it and how to draw it. Um, yes, you're, you'll are you be able to uh, download a, a PDF after. Uh, still have to put it online. But um, the uh, if you want to uh, try the adventure of making your own um, that's going to be one way to uh, to draw it. So uh, that part will uh, have a, uh, a short primer on uh, spherical astronomy, and map projections, and uh, how to draw astrolabes. So uh, yeah, I think Mark said everything. Um, just a quick word about the uh, National Geographic um, uh, Nice Sky Odyssey, like uh, Mark said. See. Uh, it's a uh, open air planetarium. Um, basically, you have a uh, headset with augmented reality. So you see the sky through the headset and the uh, telephone in the headset shows you um, the sky basically like uh, any um, any other uh, planetarium app. And the presenter in front just explains things in the sky. Um, the seats you see there are heated. So we're able to, uh, well, they're able now, I'm not a part of the team anymore, but uh, they're able to have presentations until uh, rather late in the year. They were hoping to do all year round, but uh, yeah, they figured that uh, the public does not uh, <laughs> believe it's uh, comfortable at uh, minus uh, in uh, sub-zero temperatures. Okay, so what the Astrolabe is and what it's not. So it's uh, basically an analog computer. Um, back then, of course, they did not have all the electronics and uh, they had to rely on whatever they could to um, calculate stuff. And it was actually a stroke of genius to uh, figure out a way to put on a piece of paper or wood or brass or any other uh, substrate, um, a, a projection of the sky. And it, it evolved, but uh, we're going to see uh, in a few minutes how. So it, its main use is for timekeeping. Um, it's not for lunar and planetary position, so you cannot uh, find the position of the moon or planets with that, uh, contrary to what a lot of people think. And it's not for navigation. There's a there's a different instrument for uh, navigation, which is also called an astrolabe. But uh, yeah, it's not worthy of the word. Uh, David King, who uh, who's uh, a world um, uh, world renowned expert on uh, astrolabes, uh, says in his uh, document uh, the astrolabe um that the uh, mariner's astrolabe is to a real astrolabe as a donut is to a multi-layered wedding cake his capital is not mine um it's not difficult to understand draw or use um despite the uh, shroud of mystery around it uh, mm -hmm. so we're going to see how uh, how that can be so a uh, very brief history it was invented by the greeks the uh, the legend says that uh, ptolemy had a um uh, an armillary sphere, which is basically a set of rings representing the equator, the tropics, the ecliptic, and so on. And um, that um, he dropped it from his horse, camel, dromedary, whatever he was riding at that moment, and that uh, the animal stepped on it and crushed it. And he was very sad, uh, Ptolemy was very sad, not the animal. Uh, he was very sad to see that... Um, his beautiful device was um, basically destroyed, but he realized that, according to the story, of course, he realized that it was still usable. 
so um that's how the um uh, the astrolabe was invented of course it's um it's an apocryphal story it's uh, probably not true but it makes it for nice storytelling and um, we have proof that it was invented by the greeks because the first few treaties about the astrolabes um now lost or still existing, uh, depending on which one, um, because there were quite a few, but um, they were written by Greeks or Syriac people. So um, um, in the uh, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th century. And then after that, the Arabs uh, perfected it. They added uh, parts of it, uh, parts to it, uh, lines, curves, and a few other um extras, uh, not to say gadgets. So the, the parts, um, here we have the, um, they look like gold, but it, it's really brass. So we have the uh, the plates. Uh, the plates carry the, uh, the most important information there. Uh, it's the local information. So each plate was done for a specific latitude. Uh, back then in, uh, in ancient Greek, uh, the uh, latitudes were called climata, so the climates. Uh, that's where we got the uh, the word climate from. Originally, it meant inclination, and so nothing to do with uh, with the weather. And the uh, the plates are um, you can see on. Uh, do I? Have a, I don't think I have a. Uh, yeah, I don't have a pointer on that. Yes, I do. So you can see here the um, the the grid that's engraved on the uh, the top plate is not the same as the grid that's engraved on the bottom plate. So each of those plate is for a specific latitude, and those are uh, called the uh, the plates or the tympani, uh, which is the same word as the tympan, the uh, the little membrane we have in the in our ears. Uh, we also find the alidad and the pin or horse. Uh, the the pin or horse is what holds the pieces together. It's the uh, little thing on the left. And uh, we have the uh, the mother or the mater in the in Latin, which is the beautiful piece on the left, which uh, is uh, is used to uh, house the, uh, the 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 plates. So you put all the plates in there. Uh, with the one that you're currently using on top, and uh, then you um, attach the pieces together with the uh, the horse that we've seen before. Uh, the limb is the uh, the outline, the periphery of the instrument. It carries some in, uh, indications. Normally, the uh, for more modern astrolabes, it carries the times of day, and the. Um, the, the most artistic piece is the one on the right. It's called the, the rete in the, in Latin, or the spider. Uh, rete means uh, network, hence the uh, French word réseau and the uh, Spanish word red, uh, which mean uh, network. And the, uh, the 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 reason why we would call it the spider is basically. Um, Self-explanatory. I mean, it does look like a spider web. Uh, the throne is the part on top here of the mother, and there's a ring that we don't see too well. It's uh, behind there. That's uh, served. That's uh, that's used to hang the instrument. Uh, so I'll um, I'll stop sharing for a minute. I'll show you my astrolabe. So um, the um, the instrument is held by the the ring. So uh, you use uh, you don't uh, hold it like we see the uh, statue uh, of uh, Champlain. I can't remember where that statue is, but Champlain is holding his astrolabe by the bottom. It's not how you hold an astrolabe. And by the way, he's holding a mariner's astrolabe, so not a uh, planetary astrolabe. So you hang the instrument, or um, you put it uh, flat on the table with. And that's going to sound strange with the south on top. So the the ring is a, a very important piece because that's how you uh, you hang the instrument uh, to use it. 
if not for the rain, uh, you would probably not be able to use the, uh, the instrument properly. So let's go back to the presentation. So um, the lines and curves now on the astrolabes, there's a uh, whole set of lines and curves. Um, we'll see in a few minutes that it basically comes from the fact that any circle on the celestial sphere is drawn as a circle on the, the, the projection on the map. Um, a circle can mean a circle of infinite radius, in which case it becomes a straight line. Uh, so we have the right horizon, the horizontal line, and the meridian, which is uh, the vertical line from top to bottom. Uh, we have the azimuth lines, which are um, basically the, uh, well, the, I would call it a, another spider web there. Um, the lines that radiate from not quite center. Uh, we have the celestial equator, which is the line here around the instrument. And we have the tropics of Cancer and the tropic of Capricorn is the uh, the periphery of the instrument. Sometimes some instruments have a little bit uh, of um, more, um, let's call it real estate ar around the uh, Tropic of Cancer of uh, Capricorn. I chose not to have any on, uh, on mine, but it's possible. So what is the right horizon? It's basically the, um, the horizon if you were if you were at the equator so uh it doesn't serve any real purpose except for the fact that basically anything to the left is east and to the right is west i have clicked okay <laughs> so like i said the main news is for timekeeping it can tell you the date hopefully it can tell you the time of day and it can tell you the time of night it was also used um, during the Middle Ages, mostly, and up to rather recently, let's say the 1700s, to determine prayer times, um, uh, the Salat prayers for the Muslims and the canonical hours for the uh, the Catholics, the Christians. Uh, actually, not only the Catholics, but all um, all Christian denominations. So the Muslim have five prayers. Um, one is at the, the uh, at dawn. One is just after noon. Uh, another one in the middle of the afternoon. Another one at sundown, and another one in the uh, preferably in the early part of night. If you think that's a lot, um, Christians have something like uh, seven or eight prayer times. So the uh, Vespers at, in the evening, the Matins in the uh, morning, but before dawn, um, the uh, Lods, the Ninth, the Sixth, and so on. So, uh, yeah, um, somebody was needed to, um, to determine when uh, it was that time. And uh, the only way to know uh, for sure was to look at the sun and uh, look at the position of the sun in the sky. And with the astrolabe, it uh, gives you the information rather uh, very practically. So there are other uses. For example, you can find the times of sunrise, sunset, the astronomical, nautical, and civil uh, dawn and dusk, the horoscope, not the newspaper kind, and the uh, midheaven. So the horoscope is the point of the ecliptic that is rising at any given moment. And the midheaven is the point of the ecliptic that is well at midheaven, so on the meridian. Can I tell you also the rising and setting times of the stars, the position of the stars and the sun, and it can do some coordinate conversion. So um, we'll stop um, sharing for a minute. So how does it work exactly? So I have this astrolabe here, and um, let's say I want to know what time it is right now. Um, so right now we're at night, so I'm going to need a star. Uh, there's a set of some stars, uh, depending on the astrolabe, you can have a few, as few as 10, and some astrolabes have uh, as much as uh, 50, uh, which I find a little too much. I, I think I put like 19 on mine. Yeah. So each little metal pointer represents a star. 
um, or a set of stars. For example, here we have the Big Dipper, so the tail of the Dipper and the bowl here. Uh, we have Orion here. Uh, the Summer Triangle is the set of stars here and so on. So I take one of those stars that's visible right now. Uh, hopefully there are no clouds. I don't know about London here in the uh, I'm not exactly in Montreal, but uh, close to Montreal, um, I still have some light pollution. Um, so I won't be able to do any real measurement, but let's say I take Betelgeuse. So with the with the little thing in the back, uh, you can see that there's a hole here and there's a hole here. So I point, excuse the noise of my chair, I point towards uh, Betelgeuse, wherever it is, and I adjust the thing until uh, I adjust the ruler here until I can spot Betelgeuse through the uh, through the lines here, through the uh, the little holes. That gives me the height of Betelgeuse in the sky. So what I do after, let's say I measured thirty five degrees. So after that, I take uh, the front of the astrolabe and I find Betelgeuse which is, of course, in Orion, and I put it at 35 degrees. So each line in the back, I can't see too well here. So each of the radial lines, basically like the concentric circles, is a height in the sky. So I just put Betelgeuse at the height of 35 degrees, wherever it is, and then I take my pointer, and I need to know the position of the sun in the sky. And with the position of the sun in the sky, I uh, point one and the other on the ecliptic. So I need the position of the sun on the ecliptic. Uh, so for these days, it's, um, it's, in, um, it's just before Aries, so here. And then with Betelgeuse placed properly, I can read the time on the edge of the instrument with the ruler. Um, you can see that there's two sides. Um, I need to know which side is which. And uh, I can place Betelgeuse on 35 degrees on either side of the sky. So I need to know if it's east or west. But those are just a few extras um, <coughs> consider. How do I do if it's daytime? So. In the daytime, I find the position of the sun on the ecliptic. And for that, there's a calendar in the back. Uh, the back is much dirtier. Uh, normally, I clean it, but uh, I find that um, not cleaning it gives it a nice patina. And uh, I've decided not to clean it anymore in the last uh, few years now. So you can see the uh, fingerprints of everybody who touched it before me. So we can just need to find a... I had it two seconds ago. Okay, so you can see here Cancer, and just below that you can see Quintilis, which is the old name for uh, July, until Julius Caesar decided to rename it July. And um, so Quintilis and Cancer is there, and the rest of the um, the circle is the uh, the rest of the uh, calendar. So what I do is I find the date, February 16, and I find the sign of the sun, and not only the sign, but also the exact position within the sign. So for February 16, I, ha I have Aquarius 26 degrees. So I find Aquarius 26 degrees on the front ecliptic, on the Riti, Aquarius 26 degrees is here, wrong sign. So it's here, and then I measure the, the height of the sun in the sky, the same way I measured Betelgeuse, except of course, I don't look at it with my own eyes, I just project the shadow. And then let's say the sun is uh, 30 degrees high, so I place the point of the ecliptic here on 30 degrees. Again, east or west, need to decide, need to know. 
And then uh, once it's there, I have the time on the uh, on the outline of the instrument. So the thing that we'll be able to download is one of those here. It's uh, slightly different, but it's the same principle. So you have the um, the um, the really is the transparent thing here, and the stars are all plotted on it, and the ruler, and in the back there's a uh, simple but uh, efficient um, ruler with a few other lines. Everything is explained. I, I wrote a small uh, 36 booklet to explain uh, how it works. So let's go back to the presentation. So um, how do I know the time of sunrise while I put the... Um, Excuse me. I put the uh, point of the ecliptic where the sun is on the horizon. I put the um, the ruler in line with it, and I know the time of sunrise. Same for sunset and so on. Um, the twilight. Uh, there is actually a um, a set of three lines under the uh, below the horizon. So one for each kind of uh, uh, of uh, twilight and uh, dawn and dusk and so on. And same for the stars. And coordinate conversion, well, the um, the outline of the instrument will give me uh, right ascension, and the ruler in the front will give me the declination, so I'll be able to uh, align it with the ecliptic and then find the ecliptic longitude and latitude of uh, each star uh, this way. So how to draw it? Uh, first, um, let's do a very quick primer on uh, spherical astronomy. So um, I think we're all familiar with the uh, celestial sphere, the uh, what looks like a, uh, a globe <coughs> around, around the Earth. The Earth is the little blue dot in the middle. Um, it has poles, of course, north and south celestial pole, and uh, I wrote the north and south ecliptic pole. The equator is the projection of the Earth's equator in the sky, and the ecliptic is the apparent path of the sun in um, the sky all around all along the year and we have the two tropics the tropic of cancer which is the highest or northernmost uh, point that the sun will reach on june and the tropic of capricorn which is the southernmost place that it will reach in december um i need to do a parenthesis about spherical trigonometry i'm I know that trigonometry is a subject that scares people off most of the time. So please don't uh, disconnect or fall asleep or leave the room. It will be very quick. Um, the, um, the the what we know now ha as uh, trigonometric functions uh, did not already did not always exist. The uh, the early Greeks did not know those functions and the. Um, there were there was no way for them to calculate a lot of stuff in the sky except by using the astrolabe, and same for the uh, first uh, Muslim uh, Arabs who uh, started working on the astrolabe. It took almost the the twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth century before. Uh, well, the the sine function was discovered rather early, and then the other functions took a little bit of time. But with the astrolabe, we were uh, able to uh, understand better how they work and how they relate to the sky. And it's very difficult to convert um, one position to another if we don't do trigonometry. With trigonometry, it's very easy. You just throw in a few tens, sins, cos, and whatnot, and you have the, uh, the answer. But without it, you need another way. And for centuries, for centuries, really, the uh, the astrolabe was the answer to um, a, a lot of uh, problems that they were uh, facing uh, uh, those who wanted to do astronomical calculations. Um, how to draw it? Let's do a, a very quick primer on map projection. So any sphere projected into a plane will be deformed. If you take an orange, if you peel the orange, if you try to put the orange peel flat on the table, it will break. Um, that's very sad for the orange, 
but it's also sad for um, whoever wants to create a map or read a map because there will be the deformation. You cannot keep angles and distances or um, surface areas, uh, ratios and stuff like that. You cannot keep everything together. Um, so very early um, humans have tried to um, project things uh, on a map and they've been using a lot of different ways, uh, a few of which we'll cover tonight, uh, to project things on a map. So the first is the orthographic projection. So basically you put your eye at the infinite distance and what do you see? You see half the thing. Half of the years right now is uh, the map we have on the right. So we see that um, it looks a little bit like what an astronaut would see. Um, if we were far enough, um, even on the moon, we don't see exactly half the Earth. Uh, we're too close. So really, we would have to be at infinite distance. But that is what we could see. Um, of course, we can notice, for example, that the British Isles are very squished. Um, same for anything that's uh, far in the north or far on the east or west. The islands here in the middle are not too squished, not too deformed, but it doesn't last too long before uh, you reach uh, places that are deformed enough for um, any, um, how do they say in movies, uh, any resemblance uh, uh, real or uh, remote is purely uh, um, an accident. <laughs> Uh, another projection is the conical projection. So basically, you have a cone. I thought I, have a, I, thought I had a picture. Anyway, um, so you have a cone, and you project on the cone, and then you uh, unroll the cone. Um, we see here that Greenland is basically the right size, but um, South America becomes very large, so the tip here of South America becomes almost wider than Greenland, whereas in real life it's uh, much narrower than that. And uh, same for uh, the other side in the west and uh, anything far from the um, reference uh, parallels is very stretched. Another one is the cylindrical projection, the one that uh, made uh, Mercator famous, which uh, makes Greenland huge. Um, Greenland is not as big as uh, Africa or South America, even though on that it looks like it is. Um, it looks also like the uh, northern and southern regions of the Earth, the polar regions are very vast. Uh, yeah, they are, but uh, not that much. So um, from uh, uh, Montreal to Vancouver, we have the same distance as, uh, well, uh, what, three, three and a half, four squares. We have the same distance as uh, from one side of Africa to the other. It's not exactly the case in real life because of uh, um, polar deformation. So yeah, this map is... Uh, not very uh, useful either. And the other one which uh, interests us tonight is the spherical projection, the stereographic projection, so sorry. So this one, you have a point, uh, let's say at the North Pole or the South Pole, and you project onto a map. So whatever you have in your way gets projected on the map. And of course, what is closer to the uh, to the point of reference becomes very uh, distant from the center of the map. So for this one here, for example, we have a projection from the south side of the Earth to the north side, uh, actually the opposite of the drawing on, on left. So the, uh, the Earth's pole is straight in the middle, and then as you move outwards, uh, you get more to the south. And it becomes very deformed. I mean, look at that here. The south part of Africa is so huge. Um, it's not even believable. Whereas Greenland uh, becomes shrinked to basically nothing. Greenland is bigger than Quebec. 
uh, here uh, Quebec is bigger than Greenland. So yes, it's a deformation, but that's the one that, um, that the Greeks used for the astrolabe. And that is also why um, the uh, projection of the astrolabe stops at a certain point beyond the uh, Tropic of Cancer or of, of Capricorn. Um, things would be too deformed, too uh, too far from the, uh, the the North Pole to be useful. So that's why the uh, the instrument stops somewhere. I mean, it has to stop somewhere anyway, but uh, it's uh, one practical reason. So as I said earlier, any circle on the celestial sphere remains a circle on the projected map surface. So let's say we have the circle of the tropic here, tropic of Capricorn, the line from the north to the point, any point on the line would make a circle on the, uh, on the map. As I said earlier, the, uh, the radius can become very large or even infinite. Uh, if it's infinite, it's easy, it's a straight line. Um, for some of the lines on the astrolabe that I made, um, the radius was uh, 60, 70, 80 inches. I had to take a few uh, bars of metal, um, find a way to put them end to end and make them stable together um, as if they were only one plant a nail in one part and plant a nail at the other end and find a way to um, place that somewhere in the apartment that I had enough room. Fortunately, the apartment was big and then I managed to engrave my uh, astrolabe plate. And that would also be the case for even a small astrolabe. I have an astrolabe that's only uh, four inches. It fits in the palm of my hand. But even that astrolabe, I had lines on it or curves on it with very, very wide um, radiuses really, that I had to uh, <coughs> long metal bars to, um, to do them. So how to draw it? The uh, timpani and the riti um, will move now to... Um... Okay, I need to stop the share. <coughs> share my other screen here. So you'll understand why I did not do that with um, PowerPoint because there's a bit of calculation here. So right horizon and meridian, that's very easy. It's the straight lines. Uh, one north-south, one east-west. Um, you cannot go wrong with that. As long as they're perfectly 90 degrees from each other, you're fine. The equator, so you start from the uh, center of the map and then you take a line uh, tilted by the um, inclination of the ecliptic. So 23 degrees and not quite a half. And at the point where the um, the line touches the, uh, the Tropic of Capricorn around, you start another line to the left of the right horizon and where it crosses the uh, meridian, then you have the um, the radius of the equator. For the Tropic of Cancer, it's the same thing, but from the equator, uh, you start the line. The horizon, now the fun begins. Um, you start a line with the latitude. I put here the latitude of London, Ontario, which is about 42 degrees, 43 degrees. You made the line across and draw another line here to the uh, right horizon. Where it crosses is the lowest point of the horizon. And where it reaches all the way in the top, the prolongation of the, um, the meridian is the top of the horizon. Of course, this part will not be drawn. It's gonna be outside the range of the, um, of the plate. And then you have the horizon. For the Almucantarets, those are the uh, lines of height in the sky. So um, the concentric lines that, well, not exactly concentric, but the concentric lines that tell you how high an object is in the sky. So for each one of them, you have its height, A, altitude, and you add it to your, uh, to your location's latitude on one side, and you subtract it from the uh, location's latitude on the other side. Draw a line, draw another line here, and 
join the two lines and you have the top and the bottom of the um of the animal interact. Of course, only the part <coughs> of the plate is kept. The azimuth curves very similar. Um, the line here is for the azimuth. So for example, here I have 15 degrees. So the angle between those two lines is 15 degrees. And there's a place here, the uh, the nadir. So you just imagine an amurkantarat at minus 90 degrees. And you have the zenith here at plus 90 degrees. And between the two is the uh, center line of the um, the azimuth lines. And for each of them, you just draw the part of it. And if you show all the construction lines, it's a mess. So, um, of course, you don't use ink uh, when drawing on a paper. You use um, something that you can wipe off, um, pencil. Uh, on metal, you can use ink, but then you need to, um, to wipe it. And uh, it's actually easier on metal uh, because as long as you don't engrave it, you're fine. And then the um, the other thing is the uh, spider or the reti. Um, I love that Latin name, reti. So for the ecliptic, well, it's simple. It's between the uh, Tropic of Capricorn and Tropic of Cancer. And then you have your ecliptic. The division of it is a little tricky. We'll see it in a second. First, you find the ecliptic pole, which is excuse me, the um, inclination of the uh, of the Earth, so 22 degrees, divide by 2, and you have the point here. To divide it, so you start from the pole, and you use the, um, here, the equator, divided at every 10 degrees. You join them together to the ecliptic line, and then the line, the graduation line goes towards the center of the instrument. For stars north of the equator, you uh, take the 90 degrees minus the declination of the star to the equator, join the line, and that's the radius of the uh, where it intersects here. So, for example, we have Vega here. And for stars south of the equator, same thing, 90 degrees minus the declination again. So, of course, again, it's going to give us something more than 90 degrees. And you join here, you join the two, and where it uh, touches, you have the um, the circle of um, the uh, the parallel for the star. So here we have uh, Sirius. Again, if we show everything, it's a mess. Long live the um, the eraser and the um, ink blot uh, wiping. <laughs> So for the uh, for the rule the uh, the ruler the, um, the the bar that we have in front of the instrument, you basically take every declination from um, minus uh, the um, the tilt of the ecliptic, twenty two degrees and a half, um, and then uh, from there to ninety degrees. Why not uh, lower declinations? Well, because the tropic of Can of Capricorn is there, so uh, that's the limit of the instrument. And uh, that's it. I uh, I think I went a little fast. I was supposed to uh, take a little more time, but uh, yeah, I spoke fast. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, if you have any question, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, I know that uh, Mark has brought a uh, an astrolabe. I think you even said two astrolabes to the to the meeting room, so uh, you can actually see one uh, better than. You can see this one here. Uh, you can actually manipulate um, the ones that uh, Mark brought. I had uh, fun with this little one that's, uh, like I said, fits in the, basically in the palm of my hand. Would you believe it was actually more difficult to make than the biggest one? And uh, on paper, I can't remember exactly how many I made, but uh, upwards of 100. Um, all of them customized for whoever I give them to. And the, uh, the one that you'll be able to download is uh, customized for London, Ontario, uh, with the, uh, the position given for it uh, on uh, Wikipedia. So, yeah, now if you have questions, uh, I'm all ears.
Okay, so just looking out in the in the house here, I notice a quizzical expression. <laughs> so, do you have a question? Yes. Um, how how long did it take you to uh, make the large asteroid? Um, in absolute time, five years. Um, of course, it was not working daily on it. Um, I started in 2015 and I finished in 2020. I would say probably around 200 hours. Um, I had to put a pause on it because I was working. I had a miss, uh, the bad idea of working inside. And uh, at some point, the... Uh, uh, my uh, my ex's daughter uh, had a piece of metal lodge itself in her uh, eyelid. Is it from my astrolabe's uh, engraving or uh, metal shards or, or, or at the park? It could have been at the park, but of course, finger was pointed. It was my fault. So uh, no more uh, working of the uh, on the uh, no more metal works inside the apartment. And uh, then uh, outside, I. Well, I uh, it's a little colder here than in London, but uh, we get basically the same kind of weather. So uh, six months a year, I can't, too cold. And the other six months, uh, well, well, we have uh, two months that are too hot. <laughs> and uh, I have a I had a neighbor that I did not like downstairs, so I did not want to work outside anyway uh, on it. So um, after I... Uh, after we broke up, I moved in by myself, and then I have one room completely devoted to uh, metalworks. So uh, I was able to finish it then. So that's one reason why it took five years. But uh, yeah, I, in the hours, I would say about two hundred. Thank you. Can you can Pardon? Yeah, I think Pierre can hear you just fine. So um... the room view is available under my name. Okay, yeah. Um, so, Pierre, the room view is available under Peter Jadicki's name. Um, so, you, uh, although I do actually have you spotlighted at the moment, but uh, you may be able to see that under gallery. So, what I have here tonight, I have uh, an example of an astrolabe, which I've already passed around, actually, Pierre. So, everybody in the audience has had a chance to see this. Has everybody had a chance to look at this? You can come and take a look at it in the light as well afterwards. Um, I also have a, have a Volvel here tonight. That's the other thing I have. Do you have anything you'd like to say about Volvels? I noticed that you uh, mentioned it in the same breath as the Astrolabe in almost the very first sentence in your talk, um, but you haven't really talked about Volvels very much. Do you want to mention a little bit about them as well uh, for folks who might want to inspect a Volvel for themselves? Yeah, I'll just move out of the screen a minute because I'll grab one that I have here. Um, with the valves, you can make them do basically anything and everything. And in uh, 1540, um, some guy called Peter Apianus, uh, Peter Binovitz, if I remember well, is uh, his uh, real name. Uh, Apianus was just the uh, Latinized name. He made a beautiful book called the uh, Astronomicum Caesarium, the Astronomy of the Caesars. Oh, that's lovely. In yes. it, you can find a lot of volvels like this one here, um, which is a um, an equatorium, basically. Uh, what is an equatorium? It's a um, it's the uh, it's basically a model of Ptolemy's uh, solar system's view. So you have the uh, the Earth in the middle, and then planets go on small circles called the epicycles which turn on the big circle called the deferent, which is not centered on the Earth. And uh, the movement is uh, uniform as seen from yet another point called the equant. And then, uh, so you have all the all those points um, here. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> that's funny. I move it. Okay. Uh, okay. So you have them here. All the three points are in the middle of the instrument, and the um, so each one of the uh, volvels has upwards to uh, six or even seven uh, paper discs that you can turn, and there's a set of little piece of string 
uh, that you can use to join uh, the uh, the quant, the different, and the earth. Um, it's a beautiful instrument. He made it so that you could use it from between minus 7,000, uh, 4,000, 7,000, I think 4,000, to plus 4,000. So he was very optimistic for how long his instrument would last. Uh, <laughs> but it works. That's the magic part. It works. Um, the uh, the theory it's based on is Ptolemy's theory. It's a wrong model of the solar system, the geocentric model. But hey, it works. Uh, with it, I was able to calculate the position of Jupiter to about two degrees of uh, error margin. What's two degrees? It's basically my thumb at arm's length. That's nothing uh, for something made of paper. That's well, uh, depending on what part of it you see is either 500 years old for the paper model or the uh, mathematical model is 2000 years old. So basically a Volvel is just a piece of paper that, or any other thing that you can turn on something else to um, to get um, uh, the result of a mathematical uh, calculation. And it's a, it's a wonder. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so do we have any other questions out in uh, the virtual world? Do I see any hands up out there? Just want to check to make sure that everybody gets their questions answered. So, so let's say you've made one of these things. Either you've made one in metal or you've downloaded a paper version like the PDF that you're going to point us to. Um, and uh, uh, and you want to sort of take it out of a night and show your friends, uh, what would you recommend as the as the best sort of starter demo? We're like, hey, check out my new astrolabe. Um, the sun, uh, obviously, it's the uh, the most easy thing and the easiest thing to see in the sky. Um, I've tried using. I, I was saying uh, early in the presentation that uh, I point. Beetlejuice, but actually seeing a star in the little holes. Right? <laughs> yeah, um, I can do handstand better than that, I guess. And yeah. no, I cannot do handstands. Um, yeah, it's mission impossible. Uh, job for Tom Cruise, I guess. Uh, I managed once to see Vega, maybe two seconds, just enough to get a hint of its height in the sky. I had to guess more than anything. So yeah, uh, I would say use it on the sun. Don't look at it directly. Like I said, use the holes to uh, project the, the shadow of the sun on the uh, on the uh, second uh, pinnule, and then uh, you'll be able with mine uh, with the uh, the metal one. Um, I was able to get the time very precisely and before i say how precisely um the time we have on our beautiful plastic and metal rectangles called cell phones is not the real time it's not 841 right now um for the very simple reason that um you're about what 600 kilometers from here and it's the same time for you as it is for me okay uh we're uh uh, about six degrees of longitude, so it's about uh, eight minutes difference. Uh, actually, more than that. Uh, six, yeah, it's almost 40 minutes difference. So uh, why is my phone showing me the same time as it is in London? Because we're all in the Eastern time zone. If somebody decided that we're going to divide the Earth in slices of 15 degrees, and um, deal with it because in each of these uh, zones, it's the same time. It makes for great things for uh, transportation. If you are waiting for the train at 8.41, you don't need to know uh, if it's 8.41 London time or 8.41 Montreal time. It's 8.41 for everybody, except that it's not the real time. So there's the uh, there's a first correction called the correction in longitude. So basically it's your distance from the uh, central meridian. Central meridian is uh, 75 degrees. 
So you guys, I think you're at uh, 81 degrees, something like that. So you have about six degrees difference. So each degree is four minutes. And I'm at 74 degrees and a few uh, minutes. So it's uh, about uh, four minutes. I have about four minutes difference and you guys have about 40 minute difference with that. And then there's the correction for the sun, the uh, what we call the equation of time. Uh, because the sun sometimes is faster than 24 hours and sometimes a bit slower and this accumulates. So uh, at any given moment, the day is not 24 minutes and 24 hours and 15 minutes, but the accumulation of the error can go up to 18 minutes uh, one way or another. So you need to correct for that. So doing those two corrections, the equation of time and the uh, correction in longitude with my astrolabe, I was able to find the time to about two minutes difference, which is very good. Um, the worst time is around noon because the sun is at uh, its highest point in the sky. It moves very slowly uh, in uh, in height. So there's not much difference between 11 and 12 and 1. It's at almost the same height, but of course, there's a big difference between rising and setting that it's on the horizon. So the closer you are to um, rising or setting, the uh, the more precise it gets. But yeah, uh, even around noon, I get about five, 10 minutes uh, precision. So it's uh, very good. Uh, with a small one, slightly less, of course, but uh, still uh, about 10 minutes. So not too bad. Fantastic. So um, is there any note that you'd like to leave folks on? A little um, anecdote about astrolabes in your own life or a, uh, a send-off that will, that will uh, give them the incentive or the tools they need to, to geek out on this if they want to? Oh, and Dale's got a question before we get to that. Yeah, related to your point. Yes. My question is, who makes the nicest commercial astrolabes, like if you don't uh, want to make one? Ah. Who makes the nicest commercial astrolabes, Pierre? I will refrain from answering that question. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> um, those you can find on uh, eBay, Amazon, and whatnot. Um, run away from them because they're not customized for your location. So uh, the astrolabe needs to be for your latitude. If it's not for your precise latitude, it doesn't work. Um, the error may not be that big. Uh, for example, my astrolabe was started when I was at my old apartment in Montreal. And now I'm uh, basically halfway between the Montreal and the Ontario border. Uh, so a little more south than Montreal, more to the west, but more to the south. And the difference is not much. It's like a quarter degree. And with the astrolabe, it's an error of about one minute. So if, um, if I go something with uh, an astrolabe that's made for 40 degrees and here I'm at uh, basically 45, uh, I will be wrong by 15, 20 minutes. So yeah, it's uh, not usable. I, uh, I also have seen um, astrolabes that were purchased in, uh, in suits in uh, Morocco and the um, quality was really, really, really bad. Um, notice on mine the uh, the lines are very very thin um, in the um, in the four, 1500s uh, an astronomer named Tycho Brahe uh, he realized that every instrument no matter what kind of instrument not only the astrolabes but it, every instrument has its own error um, the the um, the, the, the line itself, where you take the measurement, has a thickness. Are you measuring on the left of the line or on the right of the line? The thinner your line is, the better it is. Um, the astrolabe I've seen that was purchased in, uh, in Morocco was uh, supposedly a, a, a real one that was working, but none of the plates made sense, and the lines on it um, the, the device was like about six inches wide. The lines were almost one eighth of an inch wide. So, I mean, 
from one side to the line of the line to the other side of the line, it's an error of two, three, four, five minutes. Easy, easy, if not 10 minutes. Excuse me. Um, so anything you can find, like I said, on uh, Amazon and whatnot, as long as it's not customized, it's useless. Uh, it's going to make a nice decoration in your living room, okay, but it won't be useful. Um, there are not very many uh, astrolabe makers in the world. Um, there was one in um, in Switzerland, Mr. Uh, Martin Bruno, uh, who retired recently. And there's a woman in France, uh, Mrs. Alex, I forgot her other name. And uh, she um, she makes customized astrolabes, but they're all computer uh computer drawn uh, whereas mine are hand drawn I think for now that as far as I know I don't want to affirm this but as far as I know I'm the only one in the world who makes handmade customized uh, astrolabes of brass um, so yeah uh, that's why I refrain from answering because I don't think that's you can find a commercial astrolabe that is uh, worthy of uh, of your money because you're going to spend a lot of money on it uh, for a good one. Mrs. Alex sells hers for upwards of a thousand euros. Uh, count how you want. It's uh, at least uh, 1,500, 2,000 Canadian. Uh, yes, the price is about the same for mine, but uh, they're hand-drawn, so uh, you don't pay for a computer machine to... Uh, to draw it, you pay for a real guy who's really working on it. So, uh, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> commercial isolates, yeah, not really good. <laughs> yeah, there are some that look good on your mantelpiece, but they won't actually work. I exactly. Think that's, uh, you go on Amazon, and that that's for lots of ancient-looking astronomical instruments. That's kind of the the thing, and there it's like you know, same thing with antique replica telescopes. Most of them. They're only good for the mantelpiece. They're not actually good for looking through. Um, so if you want, if you want a working um, one, yeah, building it yourself is probably the way to go. I would say the same thing even for you know a simple sundial, uh, which I really like. All different. There's so many different kinds of sundials, and there's so many that you can buy that will not even come close to telling you the the time. Yeah. Uh, I've gone into people's backyards before and they said. You know it's supposed to be pointed kind of north, <laughs> like to work. You know, so there's you know, a lot that goes into it, uh, even in you know when you place it somewhere to make that work properly. And I can certainly see how much work it takes to yeah. make an astrolabe. And, and actually, for those of you who have sort of a commercial garden sundial, um, on sundials.org, I don't know if it's still to this day, but but the top article there was was a calculator that will allow you to make a little wedge for yourself to adjust your garden dial which doesn't work to become a dial that will actually work in your garden okay. so absolutely free except for the for the block of wood so that's uh you know a significant upgrade yeah um so uh yeah do any any last thoughts for us before we uh, uh give you a big round of applause because we really appreciate your time tonight Pierre. well i think the astrolabe yes it's a very old instrument um, but I think it's also an instrument of the past and of the future. Um, it allows us to understand better the sky, understand better how uh, things relate with, I would say, our most common um, tool, uh, mathematical tool or abstract tool, uh, that is time. What is time? Can any one of you give me a definition of time? Uh, without relying on, well, let's say, time. Uh, it's as if, try to describe the color blue to a blind person who has never seen it. Uh, not somebody who was born seeing and then became blind, and of course they will know, but uh, try to describe the color blue. You cannot describe the color blue. We can uh, explain that it's uh, so many uh, nanometers of uh, of um, wavelength, uh, but what does it tell us? There's actually no way for humans to know that what you see as blue, I don't see it as yellow, 
but we all call it blue because it's the same stimulus. But how do I see it? How do you see it? How does uh, German next door see it? We cannot know. And same with time. We cannot define time. Time is what prevents things from happening altogether. Uh, but other than that, I mean, um, so time is cycles. And the first cycle we know of, the most obvious, is the cycle of day and night. And then we have another cycle with the moon, which gives us the month. I mean, and the wars are very similar, and that's that's for a reason, because the month comes from the moon. Um, in, uh, in some countries, in some cultures, the calendar is determined by the moon. Muslim people need to observe the first crescent moon for the month to start. Uh, and it was the same thing for the Jews uh, until uh, recently and for the Babylonians back then. Uh, the, the, the month was with the moon. In some languages, it's even the same word. Dal in uh, Korean, Luna in uh, Romanian for both the month and the moon. And the third, um, third cycle we have is the year. Um, we notice it a bit more here in northern countries because we have the cold seasons and the warm season. And, but in other places, there are also seasons. For example, in Egypt, they have the, uh, the flooding of the Nile that comes back very regularly every year. Um, but it's all determined by astronomy. Um, it's the sky that rules that. And we have somehow lost this connection between humans and the sky at the most fundamental level. And I find that the astrolabe helps us to reconnect with it and understand it and not figure out why it is the way it is and why it works the way it works. So, yeah, I would recommend to everyone to at least have a paper one, a downloadable one that costs nothing. Um, maybe you're not ready to spend a few hundred thousand, a uh, few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars to, to buy one that's uh, made of brass and uh, handmade and whatnot. Uh, but uh, to have one and play with it, you're going to find out that it's very easy. It's very simple. It's not um, it's not a, a, a mystery how it works. It's not there are not a million things you can do with it. OK, there's a guy in the years 90, something like that, that wrote a book that supposedly listed 1000 uses for it. Uh, yeah, we uh, we're not sure about that, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it, it's a nice toy to have, and to have a real connection with the sky. I think it's uh, for that it's priceless. That that is fantastic. Well, listen, um, thank you very much again, uh, Pierre. It really is a great treat and a pleasure to have you here uh, today, Pierre. Please give a warm round of applause. For Pierre.